I'm a new politician. I'm just starting uh, as a politician. Modi ji, what advice would you give me? Uh -huh. And Modi ji said, uh, Tanitar ji, just be yourself. I lived m most of my life in poverty in Belgao. I got an admission for a PhD program mm. uh, in US. I needed to get that visa, uh, student visa, so I can go to America. After the interview was concluded, uh, she put a stamp on that those papers, uh, rejected. That day, I just collapsed on the ground. She rejected second time. She rejected my visa for the third time. Yeah. And she rejected that for the fourth time. Now, I sit on the Homeland Security Committee. And I'm in charge protecting America's borders. America remains the number one economic power in the world, but India is fast approaching. In a decade or so, we're going to see America, China, and India. These are the three economic superpowers. America needs India because China is very aggressive. America needs to realize that India needs to be respected. You know, India needs to be treated uh, on an equal basis. And that's what the basis has to be for a really strong relationship. U.S. has made mistakes too. Mm. It's relations with Pakistan. And I think that made India uh, stay away a little bit. Media always portrays America being rich and, uh, you know, uh, not all America is, is uh, Hollywood. My children were four and eight years old. I have two boys. And their mother, my first wife, uh, committed suicide. We lost her. Few years went by, I met Shashi. Neil was 11 years old then. He took out a, a cake, and on the cake he wrote, uh, uh, Welcome home, Mom. Namaste, Jai Hind. Today's podcast is a rags to riches story. It's about India-US relations. It's about a story of a first-generation immigrant who made it in the US. There are thousands of people of Indian origin who are at the top of the pyramid in the US. My guest today has not just a rags to riches story, but an inspiring one. It hasn't been an easy life by any yardstick. Shri Thanedar is a representative from Michigan's 13th Congressional District since 2023. In India recently, Shri Thanedar was part of a powerful bipartisan American congressional delegation led by House of Representatives India and Indian Americans, caucus co-chairs Ro Khanna and Michael Waltz. They were part of the Indian Independence Day celebrations at the Red Fort and also got to meet Prime Minister Modi. The delegation also went to Mumbai, where they met corporate leaders, spent time understanding India's digital public infrastructure, visited the Western Naval Command and met figures from Bollywood. Thank you for being part of the podcast, Congressman Thanedar. But before I begin the podcast, I want to ask you when I say Congressman Thanedar, for those listeners, for those listeners, who don't know more about the US Congress or US politics, what do you think of the Indian National Congress with the Indian National Congress? Is there no relationship with the Indian National Congress or no relationship with the Indian Darasal, the United States Congress is the legislative or lawmaking branch of the United States government and Shri Thanedar is part of that. Yani ki jab mein congressman Thanedar kehti hoon, to iska ye matlab nahi hai ki Thanedar ji ka Congress party, yani Indian National Congress ke saath koi rishta ya talukat ho. Now that I've got that out of the way, Congressman Thanedar, thank you so much for being part of the podcast. Um, very happy that you're here and just before you're about to fly out uh, back home. So you've just had a meeting today when we are recording uh, on the day that you've had a meeting with uh, Prime Minister Modi. So could you tell me a little bit or could you tell our viewers, our listeners as to what that meeting was about and how did it go? Oh, the meeting went very well. Mm -hmm. uh, Modi ji, of course, uh, spoke to me about my hometown, Belgavi. He said, when are you going to Belgao? Uh, he and I met uh, in Washington, D.C. Actually, you know, I had the pleasure to escort him when he was to address the joint session of United States Congress. This year? This year. Oh, okay. So when Modi ji came. Okay. So I was with him. I brought him into the chamber of U.S. Congress where he great this did this great speech. His mm. speech was so well received, both by the Democrats and the Republicans, that he got more standing ovations by both sides than any other head of state. Okay. 
Right. And today's meeting? Today's meeting was very cordial. Mm -hmm. It was not a very formal meeting. Okay. It was more about, he was joking, he was telling stories, okay. you know. And uh, we, with me were there uh, seven other Congress members. Mm -hmm. And uh, the agenda wasn't so much about um, specific issues. Okay. We talked about specific issues with uh, Commerce Minister. We mm -hmm. went to the Defense Ministry. We went to the External Affairs Minister. So a lot of the uh, details were all worked out with different ministers and ministries. Mm -hmm. So with uh, Modi ji, it was primarily a much more of a friendship, okay. getting to know each other. So he told about his stories, how he first came to America, uh, how his experience was. He went as a tourist. He went time. as a tourist and he okay. told about a story. Back then, there was a Visit USA program that Delta Airline had mm. where uh, $500, you can travel as much as you want in 30 days. And how he, Modiji told us about how he visited 29 different states. And at the time, he didn't have much money. So he didn't want to pay for hotels. Mm. So he would travel such a way that he will be tiling, taking the red-eye flight, that all-night flights. So that way he doesn't ever have to even stay in a hotel. So he didn't spend a single dollar on hotel stay. And he just uh, had a backpack with his few clothes. And then he would travel. Mm -hmm. And the host that he stayed in in Chicago, uh, that woman said uh, he, uh, that she only does laundry once a week. Mm -hmm. And Modi ji said to her, Mere liye, दो बार तो करना हफ्ते में क्योंकि मैं दो ही कपड़ा लेके आया हूँ। Okay, and he, I believe he still, I mean, he, he, I know for a fact that he still does red eye flights. Yes. Uh, even as Prime Minister of India. Yes. Uh, now I don't know whether that is to, to save uh, uh, the taxpayers' money <laughs> on hotels or whether because his agenda is so packed. Yes. As you would know, because yeah. when he came to the United States this summer. Um, it was uh, it was like packed with so many uh, events. It was. And, you know, the interesting thing mm. was that he and I spent uh, almost 40 minutes together. Mm. Just him and me, no me me media, no staff. We were conversing. And in between, he would walk out and they will arrange a group of Indians that want to take a picture with him. Yeah. So, so we were going back and forth between those pictures. I saw the real... Mr. Modi, he's so authentic. And we had a lot of conversation. We talked a little bit in Marathi. Mm. Uh, we sh spoke a lot in Hindi. So the PM can speak Marathi? Uh, PM can speak fluently. Marathi. He understands Marathi. But uh, we spoke a lot in Hindi. Okay. And uh, But maybe because my Hindi isn't so good, he started talking to me in Marathi a little bit. Okay. Uh, but we had a great time together. Okay. And, uh, you know, he. I asked him... Uh, I'm a new politician. I'm just starting uh, as a politician. Modi ji, what advice would you give me? Uh -huh. And Modi ji said, uh, Tanitar ji, just be yourself. It's okay. most important that you're authentic. Mm -hmm. And how you are in front of media, how you are in front of people, or you, how you are, uh, uh, you know, be, without the media, just be yourself. Just mm -hmm. be authentic. Mm -hmm. And that advice, I thought, was very, very valuable. But you have been in politics for quite some time. I'm going to get to that part, um, you know, um, uh, soon enough. Uh, was today's conversation in any manner like uh, because you were no, you were more familiar with him because yeah. you met him before? Yes. yes. So was today's uh, meeting a little different for you as compared to the other congressmen who were with you? Absolutely. You know, mm -hmm. we we spoke like we know each other. Uh, you know, I told you know last time I told him about who I am, introduced myself. And he said he knew about me because when I got elected to Congress, he happened to be in Karnataka, my home state mm -hmm. where I was born. So he said he, uh, he heard right where he was on the stage and they told that a son of Karnataka has now become a United States congressman. Mm -hmm. And he said, I spoke about you and I knew about you. Oh, so so it was a really uh, a very warm, nice uh, uh, friendship that we built in the United States. Mm. And it was good for him, uh, us to meet to again. Uh, so in this delegation that has come from the U.S., uh, you and Ro Khanna are the ones who have roots in India. Was your experience a little different from that of the other congressmen who were there? Yeah, because, you know, I lived m most of my life, 24 years old I was. I lived in poverty in Belgao. 
growing up in a very financially hardship family it was belgaum then it and was belgaum then. now it's belgavi belgavi now yeah, yeah. sure go ahead yeah. yeah but you know i would work in a doctor's office when i was 14 years old cleaning offices uh, earning some money so that i can help my family hmm. the family felt in hardship uh, financial hardship so uh, you know and then in, when i was 24 years old uh, i wanted to go uh, to us so that i can help my family help myself which year is this this was 1979 okay and uh, you know i got an admission for a phd program hmm. uh, in us so all Where? uh in Akron Ohio in okay, Ohio. Ohio so all i had to do was to go to the us embassy and get a visa in delhi in in mumbai in mumbai you okay. know so in those days you have to go uh, you know i went there at 5 am stand in line uh, no breaks because i lose my spot in the queue uh-huh. and then at 11 o'clock i got called in for my student visa interview across in, in that window was an american woman whose name was virginia So she asked me a lot of questions and I studied in Marathi medium so I didn't speak English at all mm. not very well and uh, after the interviews was over uh, just just a yeah. second for those of our viewers or listeners who are wondering uh, that belgaum marathi medium but in karnataka belgaum is in the border so there there are schools which teach uh, the medium of instruction is marathi and there are some schools where the medium of instruction is kannada and you can even go to uh, schools where the medium of instruction is english and the congressman went to a school where the medium of instruction was marathi most people speak marathi kannada as well as a smattering of hindi in belgaum go yeah. ahead sorry so, to interrupt so uh, no no this is i'm glad you said that mm-hmm. uh, so uh, you know i'm having this uh, interview mm-hmm. and this interview meant a lot because i needed to get that visa uh, student visa so i can go to america and after the interview was concluded uh, she put a stamp on that those papers uh, rejected oh no and uh, she told me that mr tanadar i cannot give you a visa i'm not convinced you should get a visa and you know i had all these aspirations and you know uh, everything oh depended God. on getting that That's student visa sad. Yeah. yeah and what have i had never lo- fainted never lost my conscience but that day i lost my conscience and i just collapsed on the ground were you alone i was alone and then uh, this miss virginia came out of her window when i opened my eyes a few minutes later i saw her holding a glass of water but uh, she gave me the water uh, but no visa oh and then later on i gave another i applied again more documents she rejected second time she was the same officer same again? officer will get my case oh my god virginia ma'am if you're watching <laughs> just look where he's reached now okay. so third time i gave her more documents she rejected my visa for the third time yeah. so fourth time i wrote to my professor in america and i said i'm having trouble getting a visa so he wrote a very beautiful letter he said this guy this scholar i need him because we are working on future uh, batteries electric batteries you were an engineer i was a sci- chemist chemist okay and so we are working on this batteries which is the future and i need you need to give him a visa so i put that letter on top uh-huh. and gave it to virginia madam and she rejected that for the fourth time my visa a month went by i had no i had no job i was doing tutoring i was tutoring home tutoring for iit entrance exams indian institute of technology yeah. okay and then mm. i took the same papers that she provided and so thought i'm going to just go submit one more time mm. no new information no new documents and in the evening i they asked for my passport i said why do you need my passport and they said we can give you a visa without a passport and i said what miss virginia change your mind and at this said no miss virginia has gone to america for her vacation and another counselor looked at it and thought it was okay oh good for you <laughs> okay but imagine uh, you're talking about 79 when there was no visa counseling uh you know nobody to advise you on how to change your resume how to how to make your you know uh, what is it called statement of purpose right yeah. statement of purpose more interesting how to tailor your uh, what the documents so that universities are more interested in you and the visa officer is not suspicious uh, but yeah uh, persistence i guess yeah five and now, times now 
I, um, as a U.S. congressman, I sit on the Homeland Security Committee. Mm -hmm. So I'm a ranking member of one of the Homeland Security Committee, and I'm in charge and I'm focused on protecting America's borders. And now I'm working on making the whole visa process streamline it. Uh, more H-1B visas. I'm trying to double the si number of H-1B visas. Currently, the green card backlog is so huge. For years, decades even for some people, more than a decade, people who are high net worth, this is what, I mean, I wanted to bring this up later in the podcast, but I'm going to start, tell you this because you're in a position to help thousands of people who won, you know, like you, come from, uh, you know, underprivileged homes, trying their best to make it in the land of plenty uh, and in the land of hope. And uh, they want to make it in the US. They've been paying taxes, high net worth individuals, uh, highly skilled individuals, but cannot get visas. So tell me, how can you help them? So I'm trying to get rid of the country quotas. Hmm. Because India has and China has country quotas that make them. Um, so sometimes people are families are waiting for 10 years, 12 years to get a green card. Yeah. A lot of hardship. But the interesting about, thing about and this is only in America this could happen. Hmm. The, the poor boy who couldn't get a visa to get into America. Now he sits in Congress trying to make writing bills to make the visa process better. And is, is there, when is this visa, do you have a time frame yeah. as to when the visa process would get better? It, it is it is a very complex thing. America's uh, immigration system, especially the legal immigration system is broken. Mm. So that needs a complete overhaul, mm. a total reform. And that's a very Herculean task. So okay. what I'm doing is I'm taking small bits of it. So I just introduced a bill that will allow uh, people with PhDs, advanced degrees, to not have to be subjected to a quota. Mm. So they can get their green card within a year or so. Okay. So I just introduced that bill. I'm trying to introduce small bills that take care of a small piece of it. I'm sure, you know, in this visit that you were he you've been here, uh, every congressman has been asked that. I mean, you you went to M Mumbai, you went to Hyderabad, I think. Uh, the and team, uh, yes, the team. some of the team went to team Hyderabad. Went, and, yeah, uh, to these places. I'm sure everybody would have been asking all of you, like, what about visas? Yeah. What about visas? Yeah. So tell us, uh, tell me something about the visit. How was this visit of yours? This has been a wonderful visit. Okay. Uh, today we met with the Commerce Minister Piyush Goyal and we talked about uh, you know, businesses and how can we streamline. Mm. Uh, China certainly is on everybody's mind. Mm. China is, you know, very aggressive. Uh, uh, their trade policies are unfair. Uh, they are, you know, uh, they, they, they are the ones that need to be stopped. And China and Russia and their collaboration is threatening and is uh, worrisome. So we talked a lot about China's aggression, We uh, whether it's a military aggression or whether it is, uh, uh, you know, manipulate, manipulating the financial markets or manipulating uh, mm. manufacturing. Mm. So, uh, so India plays a very significant role mm. in stabilizing the uh, Asian uh, Pacific region. Uh, and, uh, you know, we're talking about a strong India-U.S. relationship. Mm. You know, because of the non-alignment policies uh, right from the early uh, times, uh, start, starting from the 1947 with the freedom, uh, you know, that non-alignment policy need to be looked at because Russia is no more a superpower. I think uh, it's the Americans who are worried about Indian uh, non-alignment. I think Indians mostly have forgotten about non-alignment. Yeah. Well, but yet, you know... But, I mean, uh, technically we are still non-aligned, but I think it is, uh, uh, like they say, you know... Um, the term differently abled, I think we are we are like now choosing our partners on an issue-based matter. I think that's what is happening with the Indian foreign it policy. It is, it is. But hmm. uh, the thing is that uh, still uh, most of the military equipment hmm. is Russian-owned, Russian-made. Hmm. Uh, therefore, India Indian military is highly dependent on Russian uh, military equipment. 70-80% uh, of uh, current equipment. Because is America Russia. wouldn't sell to India. At one time, they were. Yes. I agree. Yeah. But now, 
uh, America is very eager to sell and wants that relationship. Sure. And uh, but this this switch is going to take some time. Correct. And uh, I mean, you you remember the era, right? You went mm. in the seventies when the Cold War era was at its peak. Um, India was leaning Russia, though we were non-aligned, and that suspicion has not gone. And uh, you lived in India during the seventy-one war. You know exactly where America stood and where Russia stood. And uh, India-Russia relations has stood the test of time. So it's going to be hard for India, and I don't think India is probably ready to sever those warm ties. Maybe become more diversified in its relationship, but I don't think replacement will happen uh, anytime soon or ever for that matter. True. I Did agree. you get that impression? I, I do. I do. But you know, uh, I was uh, at Red Fort uh, mm. yesterday. Correct. Sitting in the hot sun, yeah. listen. But it was uh, interesting. Yeah. Uh, listening to Modi ji's speech. Yeah. And his vision for India, the way he talked about 2047, the power of young people mm. wanting India to be uh, a economic superpower, uh, wanting India to be uh, uh, what a developed country by uh, 2047. Yeah, that's right. For the hundredth anniversary of uh, uh, of Indian independence, yeah. he said that. Did you feel the, like, did you notice similarities between what an American president's uh, State of the Union addresses and what the Indian Prime Minister's uh, Independence Day addresses? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think what I saw in that speech was a vision. A vision, uh, you know, it was a very upbeat, positive speech. Okay. You know, so I could see from the young people how, you know, and I saw a lot of excitement mm. among the young people. Mm. We were sitting there in hot sun. Mm. Uh, very, it was very, very hot, very uncomfortable. But we sat there and I saw a lot of people there with a lot of enthusiasm mm. because he spoke uh, uh, in a very positive manner. Correct. I'm going to come back to this. Uh, you know, you were talking about Russia. Uh, I'm going to quote this. In one of your interviews, you said, and I quote, the U.S. would have liked it much more if India had seen Russia's aggression for what it was and what it is, which is the Ukraine one, and taken a stand, unquote. Uh, now, if you could elaborate, uh, you know, exactly what you said, but elaborate a little more on this quote. Look, uh, you know, clearly it was an invasion of a sovereign country. Mm. Uh, and, uh, you know, the loss of civilian life, mm. uh, all of was uncalled for. And India really took its time to address that. And, and whereas United States and many of the, our European allies were very quick to understand uh, Putin's dictatorship, his uh, ambition, his uh, attack on an on a, uh, independent country. And uh, India took its time mm -hmm. uh, to, to address that. And that's what I am really uh, saying. That uh, you know, I agree with you. I yeah. think I'd, India was walking on eggshells. Yeah. Uh, uh, we have our energy requirements, I guess, yes. because of that. Mm -hmm. um, the other point is about China, which you were mentioning. Mm -hmm. uh, what is the view on, in D.C.? Is, the, is that really the only reason that D.C. and Delhi are working together, uh, China? Well, that's not the only reason. But look... Or uh, may, main reason, maybe? Uh, no, not necessarily. Mm -hmm. India, in uh, I, uh, there is a lot of respect for India. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there is absolutely a lot. And, and America respects economic power. Okay. You know, that is, uh, you know, America remains the number one economic power in the world. But India is fast approaching, currently at fifth level, very soon to be the third. So if, very in a, in a decade or so, we're going to see America, China and India. These are the three economic superpowers. Mm -hmm. And uh, America realizes the importance of India, uh, you know, uh, and, and America needs India because uh, China uh, is very aggressive. China uh, is, uh, you know, we saw supply chain issues uh, with during the COVID. chips. Yeah, during yeah. COVID. And we cannot, America understands we cannot be reliant and dependent on China. Mm -hmm. And for that, we need a partner that we can trust. So India is a partner uh, now with the U.S.? Is that how the U.S. sees it? India sees, yeah. And that's bipartisan. That's bipartisan because look at, uh, look at the reception Modi ji got in the United States. Yeah. Now, U.S. has made mistakes too. Mm. Its relations with Pakistan, 
it overly uh, over fr the friendship and military assistance and all that relationship and i think that made india uh, stay away a little bit you know and uh, naturally it became more of aligned with russia when america was being aligned with pakistan you know um while you say it's that america has realized uh, its folly in pakistan uh indians the whether it's the foreign policy establishment uh, or whether it's just the common indians uh, it's hard for indians to accept that america would ever see um reality in pakistan they bail out pakistan regardless uh, of what happens one view is that you they cannot have pakistan fail the world cannot have pakistan fail a nuclear powered nation but at the same time they bail out pakistan every time from hillary clinton's snakes in your backyard to whatever you know with what happened with afghanistan uh, but it you know america bails out pakistan every time so while you say that america realizes its folly folly is a very strong word I, nobody expects america to accept that it's a folly or a mistake it's very hard for country especially a superpower yeah. to accept that it made a mistake not even in afghanistan but is there a realization you feel well primarily democracy you know india remains uh, a lar the largest democracy mm. and uh, despite uh, you know issues we every country has problems every country has issues but uh, the respect uh, for india is not only the economic power but respect for india from america is also because it's a democracy you know it's a country where people of different religion live in relative harmony uh, people you know a different if you, every 100 miles you go you see different food different culture different language and different religion and yet uh, this democracy uh, you know uh, lives together people live together and that is something that america respects is that a message that you're taking back to you're leaving tonight uh, tomorrow morning uh, is that the message you're taking back to america and the reason i'm asking that congressman is because uh, our politician rahul gandhi india's politician rahul gandhi was in the us this year earlier this year and uh, he said that democracy is dead or dying uh, in india and uh, he said that democrats or not democrat as in the party but people who love democracy uh, in america should be concerned and there were indians in the audience as well as the organizers who said that uh, they worry for democracy in india what did you find in india and what's the message you take back well you know uh, we see a huge uh, population of indians that vote in elections so, uh, what is it 70 80% of the people vote mm. in elections there are long lines of people standing uh with the voting card the aadhar card uh, is become so easy for people to prove their who they are mm -hmm. and then vote uh, nobody's denied uh, th their chance and right to vote and the enthusiasm uh, indian people have small villages people that are not educated uh, yet they realize their civic duty and they ensure they stand in long lines and vote we have seen those pictures we have seen those so democracy i believe is uh, uh, alive and well in india and thriving and uh, india remains uh, an example of uh, how people of different culture different uh, language different religion uh, you know uh, just participate in this democratic process we've seen in india uh, governments have won and governments have lost uh, you know back in those days where i've seen mrs gandhi mm. how popular she was uh, then there are time when she lost uh, uh, her election when uh, there was issues with the emergency i was in india when the emergency was declared uh, so uh, uh, indian uh, voter is very smart indian voter is very you know understands all this and uh, they vote their mind uh, you know and uh, so it's not granted you know mm -hmm. so so the, there is a huge respect uh, for uh, uh, for india and indian democracy and uh, where india has come just last 75 years you know uh, india has come a long way it has achieved so much uh, economically and now the power of india remains with its young people you know average age 26 a uh, year average age there's a big chunk of indians who are young a and this youth power is unparalleled you know we don't have that in the united states 
uh, our average uh, population is much older. Uh, so India uh, currently has a large uh, population of young people. And that is the strength. They are the young, these young people with their technology, their skills, uh, is what driving Indian economy, what's dri- growing India. And uh, that's going to propel uh, India uh, to be the maybe the number three superpower uh, okay. in coming years. So uh, you come from the Democratic Party. And uh, will you be taking that message back to your colleagues? Because some of them have been very critical about Indian democracy. I'm going back to democracy like Ilan Omar, for example. Uh, she she believes that it's all over in India. There's Pramila Jaipal. I could name several of them. And they're all from your party uh, who don't think much about uh, democracy surviving in India, let alone thriving, which you are talking about. Well, uh, you know, uh, these Congress uh, women, Congress people who are critical of India my message to them, and when I, I say that to them uh, in personally when I meet them, that come with me to India. You know, let me, let's, don't just, just go to Taj Mahal and get a picture on the bench. Come with me to the villages. Come with me and see the real people and how they live in harmony. You know, look at the mosques in India. Look at the temples, you know, hundreds and millions of temples. And then you look at the mosque right across and look at, uh, you know, people worshipping uh, uh, their own religions And uh, are we perfect? Is India perfect? No, nor is America perfect. You know, we have our issues in America, uh, racial issues, uh, racial equity, uh, economic equity. We have issues in America, just like India has issues, uh, you know, dealing with such a large population. Mm. But I tell my congressional colleagues that uh, criticize India is that come see, don't just rely on what you read in social media or newspapers or New York Times. Come with me. Come meet the real people of India. Look at how they live their lives. Look at their aspirations. And, you know, you know, people should come and see uh, how India manages uh, huge uh, the elections. So are you telling me that those who have what you are saying is misconception, you're terming that, uh, those who have those views about India, uh, they have been led to believe that democracy is dead or dying. Uh, they didn't make up their minds by coming here and checking it out on their own. I would like them to come and see it for, with their own eyes like I have. Hmm. Look, I understand India because I lived here for 24 years. You know, I, I worked here, I studied here. Uh, most of the people don't have a first-hand uh, experience about India. So how is their experience, how how did that get colored or how did that get formed? Is it because of the newspaper articles? Is it because of television? Or the, the uh, people who have gone from India who've conveyed that message? How did they make those views? I think uh, India can do a better job of, uh, you know, marketing itself or talking about uh, the greatness that India has. Uh, often uh, the media uh, portrays India in unfairly. Some, the social media often portrays India unfairly. Mm. But, uh, you know, this is a, a country where uh, uh, there is a lot that good is happening. A uh, lot of positive thing is happening. And right. look at the amazing uh, economic progress India has made. So you met with people, uh, you know, with several people. You've met with ministers. Uh, you've met with, I mean, your your group has met with scientists. They've met with people from popular culture and all. Uh, there was a small bit of a kerfuffle which happened about, uh, you know, one of your colleagues or one of your uh, uh, people from your delegation who probably wanted to meet with Rahul Gandhi and that didn't happen. What was that all about? Well, this was a very hectic trip. Mm-hmm. And the trip was arranged by uh, the Indian uh, embassy. So they basically uh, really... The Ministry of External Affairs. Ministry and, of External oh. Affairs. So it's a, it was a Indian embassy managed trip and uh, there was just so much to do. Mm-hmm. And we didn't just have enough time. Yeah, because it seems like uh, the Congress party spoke with Indian journalists saying that the delegation was not allowed to meet them. And somebody from the delegation said that requests were put in and it it just didn't fit in into the schedule. So was the answer somewhere between these two? Well, just, just we, there was so much to do. Uh, we were busy all day. Uh, I just coming from Piyush Goel, the Commerce Minister. Uh, we spent a lot of time uh, with the Defense uh, uh, Department talking about uh, hmm. uh, you know arms and 
meeting with business leaders uh, mm -hmm. about uh, joint ventures and uh, bringing uh, American businesses to Amer to India and um, vice versa. So there was just a, a ton of things to do, lots of people to meet. So would you like to revisit India and meet with, a, you know, with politicians, not necessarily from the ruling party, but the others too? Sure. Well, I will be certainly open to. Right. You know, uh, President Biden is coming uh, this year for the G20. Uh, President Trump had a very successful visit uh, to India uh, and he had this huge stadium and there was this massive crowd. Uh, he was pretty popular in India, even though back home, the media was not giving him a comfortable uh, time. Uh, Ivanka Trump had a fabulous visit, uh, a separate visit. So uh, now comes President Biden. That was a bilateral visit. This one is not. Uh, what do you expect this visit to be like? Why didn't President Biden do a, a bilateral visit in the four years that he's been president? Well, you know, uh, President Biden and uh, Prime Minister Modi ji, they have excellent chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Biden threw a big party for him, the state dinner, yeah. which is, you know, a big deal. Uh, mm. Not every uh, visiting uh, head get a state dinner. Sure. And I was there, my wife was there, uh, and it, the atmosphere was very festive. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could see the chemistry between uh, President Biden and uh, Prime Minister Modi ji. They were joking with each other, conversing. Uh, last time Modi ji came to America, he was fasting, you know, uh, so he could not eat. Yes, he during the Navratri. Yeah, period. Navratri. So that was the uh, earlier, uh, you're earlier, visit. earlier banquet. Earlier visit. Huh. And uh, President Biden could not understand, you know, he went out of his way to <laughs> <laughs> entertain him and uh, they, he threw a big party and Modi ji won't eat. <laughs> and he kept saying, is there anything you could eat? And Modi ji saying no. And this time there was no issue about fasting. And Modi ji said he ate for both times. Okay. <laughs> but they joked about it. They were joking with each other. Uh -huh. And uh, uh, President Biden stayed with him for a long time. He spent more time than he normally spends with heads of states. Yeah. So so they have a special friendship uh, that they have developed. Just like uh, is uh, President Biden going to go in for uh, re-election? Oh, absolutely. So he, that makes the two of them, because Mr. Modi is also going in for a re-election, and both in 2024. Exactly. Quite a lot in common between them. So am them. I. So I, I, are you. <laughs> okay, let's get to your story. <laughs> so, you know, I, there's so much in uh, being written about your rags to riches story. And you did mention about how you tried your immigration process. Uh, tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, your childhood and why did you choose to go to America? And that whole process of... Like I said, rags to riches. I'll yeah. leave it to you to explain. <laughs> well, look, uh, you know, middle class, lower middle class family, six sisters, a brother. Uh, my father, uh, you know, when I was 14 years old, uh, you know, he had to retire. And the family fell into hardship, the weddings and sisters' weddings and everything. So I was the older son, eldest son, even though I was only 14. So I was working odd jobs, uh, you know, cleaning offices, working as a, a doctor's assistant, even at the age of 14. So throughout my college, I just, and I was an average student. I wasn't, a, in my SSC, I only got like 55% marks. That's the 10th grade. 10th uh, grade, exam. yeah. Correct. So so I wasn't, but then I realized that if I want to go some do something and be reach somewhere, I got to study and I got to focus. So I studied on that. I got a BSc with a distinction. Uh, worked in state bank as a cashier. But uh, that's a science degree and then you went to state bank. Back then, you know, in 79. Okay. There, there were not many jobs. There were not many jobs, not in science. So the okay. best job you could get is a bank bank job. Okay. And then I, you know, I did that for a little bit. And then I went to BARC, Baba Atomic Research Center. Okay. Worked there. And then, you know, eventually got to U.S., got my Ph.D. So this, uh, you were in uh, Chikori in... Uh, I was born Bengal. in Chikori. You were Bengal. born in Chikori. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then uh, you went to Mumbai. Then, you know, then I lived in uh, Belgaum because oh, my father Belgaum. worked in a court oh. system. Yeah, Belgavi. Huh. So because I would go, you know, he's, he'll get transferred from one uh, taluka to another. 
Okay. So so we we stayed around Belgaum for uh-huh. my 18 years of my life. Okay. And then but, but Bombay is where you were working and and later st- on I came to Bombay which uh, also has become Mumbai so quite a lot of changes yeah yeah, yeah. so so in, Mo- so in Mumbai I was at Baba Atomic Research Centers as working yes. as a scientist I worked there for 4 years okay. and then uh, finally got my student visa went to uh, America got a PhD in chemistry worked as a chemist in Illinois in uh, Michigan, Michigan you know in Michigan I worked as a uh, in postdoc uh, at the University of Michigan and then worked as a chemist in Missouri. And then I There's want- no money coming in from back home. So you must have done odd jobs yes. during those years yeah. too. I, and you know what? I When I was a PhD student, I used to get $300 a month as a stipend. And then I would send $75 every month uh, to Belgaum, uh, to my mother, so that uh, you know she can take care of the family and uh, my uh, brother's education. Mm. So this is uh, how I was. And then- uh, then I wanted to be on my own. Hmm. So uh, I got a loan from a bank, uh, $75,000. I bought a little business. and then How that, difficult was it to get a loan? Uh, or very, very. In- six banks turned me down. Oh, wow. To Just to get a small amount of loan. Uh-huh. And then finally, a bank gave me a loan and I started a, this little business. Uh, and then it grew in in by 2008. I bought this business in 1990. By 2008... Uh, the business had gr- grown worth almost $200 million. So six banks turned me down. Finally, I got a little bit of money from one bank. I, I bought this little business in 1990. By 2008, the business has grown to, you know, like I bought little companies. Um, uh, I acquired some, got some money from the bank, more money, and to acquire companies. So I had built a network of pharmaceutical uh, innovation research labs all across America. And in 2008, uh, in the, during the recession time, just before that, uh, I got an offer to buy half of my business for $135 million. Mm-hmm. And then within a week, Lehman Brothers collapsed. Okay, so you can't get that. So the private equity could not get the money to buy my business. Uh, the bank who, from whom I had borrowed $24 million, they started getting nervous. They wanted to because my revenue started dropping yeah. because my business was doing early stage drug development. So in a hard economic times, that business, uh, was, that was not happening. Hmm. So my, I lost 70% of my revenue in that recession. And uh, the bank uh, got nervous. And so they put a receiver and they took charge of my business. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, uh, when they took over the business, they gave me a box, a uh, cardboard box, and they said, Mr. Tanedar, if you want to take your personal things, feel free to, as they were liquidating my business and selling all these things. So as I put my children's p- uh, pictures from my desk on the, that box, and I was walking out of the lobby, and I saw two awards. I had won Entrepreneur of the Year Awards from Ernst & Young. So I asked them if I can take those and say, they said, okay. And as I was putting those awards in my box, I said, I'm going to win another one of these someday. I come home and the bank now also owned my home. So they decided to foreclose on my home. So I lost my business. I lost uh, my home. Um, I lost my cars. The bank took everything. And my wife and I took all our personal things, put it in a rental truck, and we started driving. So we drove from St. Louis, Missouri to Ann Arbor, Michigan, because I found out that there was a l- another little lab that in Ann Arbor, Michigan that has also gone out of business. So I go rent that space and restart my business. And in 20... 20- what is the business? Chemical testing, pharmaceutical development. But you had no pharma experience, did I, you? Well, I had a PhD in chemistry. Chemistry. Yeah. Okay. So, so that was good enough. Yeah, yeah. chemical. T- so my business was helping small startup companies uh, develop new medicine. So they would come to us with an idea. We'll make the molecule. We'll put together the whole medical uh, pills or whatever the medicine is. And we'll give them a turnkey uh, technology solution. So that was my business. Yeah. And so uh, I restarted that business, having lost everything, mm. in uh, 2010. I was 55 years old then. And then the business grew very fast. Mm. And I made sure that now the business won't fail in a recession. Mm. So I diversified in a, such a way. In 2016, I won that Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Oh, what you promised yourself. 
for the third time. Okay. And at that time, I felt, look, I've, I've been successful. I, I came to America with $20 in my po- pocket and a, and a suitcase. America has given me so much. And I, I, when I traveled around America, I saw that I achieved my American dream, but many Americans uh, ha- I ha- don't have access to that American dream. Right. You know, uh, Detroit area where I live, mm-hmm. 20% of the population is at or below poverty. Some people are having trouble paying their water bills. Mm. Some people are uh, having trouble paying their mortgages and losing their homes. Mm. And I said, there, is, there has to be more to li- my life than accumulating wealth, you know, just becoming uh, more and more uh, wealth. For- so with that thought, I decided to sell my business uh, took some of the money, gave it to all of my employees, not just the top level employees. Every person, every employee in my company got bonuses uh, as I sold the business. And then I said, I'm going to go public service. I'm going to go help people. Hmm. And the best way to help people is to become the governor of Michigan, which was unheard of. Someone like me with an accent, having come from a foreign country. First first uh, generation First immigrant. generation immig- immigrant. So I, I and it's not as if you had this massive Indian population no, there. No, or, no. So, so I worked very hard to uh, win that because I felt that I could make a difference in people's lives. Hmm. But I lost that election, uh, even though two hundred thousand—that is two lakh people—voted uh, for me to be their governor. Even though I don't look like them, I, even though I don't speak like them. So because, but they liked my story, my story of uh, struggle, st- ne- struggle, never giving up. You know. Uh, 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 you know, in 1996, uh, my children were four and eight years old. I have two boys. And their mother, my first wife, uh, committed suicide. We lost her. And Would you like to tell me what happened? Well, you know, uh, she had a mental illness uh, that we didn't know about. And uh, she, she uh, you know, took her life. And uh, it was came as a very much of a shock. Where were you when she took her life? Uh, she, we, I had taken the children because my brother was visiting. So we were, uh, uh, I, we were I was in a cave. Uh, there was a cave that we, the children wanted to visit. So we were there. They, they were, we had taken them out of school. And she went to her work. She was a doctor, a neurologist, worked all day. Uh, and then in the end, uh, when she came home, uh, she took her life. And uh, the society doesn't understand. There's a lot of taboo about mental illness. Even then? Even even now? Even now. And uh, so people kind of look at uh, a death uh, such as uh, by... uh, An unnatural death. Unnatural death. So a lot of my friends, I had eight uh, very close friends, they start talking to me. They start, you know, being with me. Did they blame you? They blame me. And not, not only I blame myself because in a death like that, you always wonder... Could I have done anything to save her? You know, I keep going back thinking about uh, what must have happened, what must have gone in her mind. But at the same time... How did you pull yourself out from that dark space? You know, I lost my friends. Uh, I didn't have any family there. Uh, I had to deal with my children's sadness, work all day. Uh, I also had my business. Mm. So I had to manage my business that had just started. Uh, deal with and uh, work with my children. My eight-year-old son, he had a lot of difficulty with understanding Mm. uh, this death. I did some counseling myself. I took the children to counseling. And I'm I'm holding up all day. I'm working hard, working on my business, helping my children, going to their parent-teacher conferences, going to their sports events, making sure that the children doesn't feel neglected or not taken care of. There was no family, uh, Congressman, like your brother, sister, nobody in America? Nobody, nobody in America. My mother would come and stay with me at some time, but she didn't speak English. She couldn't drive. Totally alien uh, culture for alien, her. Alien culture. So all day, I'm just holding up, you know, not letting my the emotions get over me hmm. and just taking care of my children, taking care of my business, dealing with the community who just walked away from me. And then at night when I put uh, read the stories to my children, put them to bed, I would go to my bedroom and I'll cry, you know. And it was a very, very tough time. And those, those days were very hard. And then three years, I took care of my children. 
and then and your uh, business was collapsing then or it uh, collapsed my business was really doing well be well. so so my so the pressures were to there. some neglect of the business uh, till the business survive mm. but uh, but it took me 3 4 years to recover from all that and in the and fortunately uh, you know i met somebody in mumbai uh, and got remarried Hmm. and uh, it's so interesting that she and i didn't know each other but her, she had lost her husband around the same time as uh, uh, i had lost my wife and then so she she came i got married my son who was 8 uh, years old he he was very suspicious of another woman coming into our family hmm. and he kept telling me dad how am i going to call another person mom and he said uh, we don't need to get you don't need to get married and then he started cooking because he thought i am getting married so that someone will come home and oh dear so he, the the young 8 9 year old boy would start cooking and and he and i said neil why are you cooking and he'll say look we don't need another mom we are fine and i can i can help so 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 a few years went by i met shashi she was and then I I had a nanny who was taking care of them while I visited India to bring Shashi to America. So uh, Shashi came to America. Neil was 11 years old then and uh, I wasn't sure how is he going to receive her. Hmm. And uh, so I brought her home and as she walked in, uh, you know, he took out a, a cake that he had baked for her. He was ready. He was ready. And on the cake he wrote uh, uh, welcome home mom. Oh. and and she's been wonderful and she raised the family and you know she came into a broken family she didn't know much of anything about america but she came in and uh, you're made, tearing up even yeah. though it was so long back 1996 it's like it's like it, yesterday like yes and what about your younger son uh, he was too young to understand the trauma of having lost a mother so he 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 was okay but my older son Uh, does a, does a family ever get over a death of the kind uh, you know which is a suicide somebody who takes away life does that like scar you for life does something like that never go away that that pain never goes away you know it may not be as hard as but uh, and my son uh, my older son still struggles with it mm. and we we still and and this always that feeling about what could we could have done differently okay. i wish i had another chance to speak with her yeah you know listen to her because you know even when you are close you never know what's going on in somebody's mind mm. you know mind is so complex and we never know really know listeners and viewers uh, and uh, if you are listening into this and you know of somebody who needs help reach out talk because that's the only way to go there are helplines available uh do call up people speak to your family um it it's not something that is there are that there are different families everybody goes through something of this sort and uh uh thank you for sharing this yeah and now in congress i'm working you know when i before i became a congressman i was a state senator state uh, representative like a mla and during that time uh, two things i did Uh, I knew education helped me overcome poverty, so I brought a lot of money to because I represent an area that's been marginalized, uh, so, so, you know, subject to uh, systemic racism. In know, Michigan. In Michigan, sixty yeah. percent of my, um, uh, you know, uh, people, Madhar Sangh, you know what you call it, their constituency, mm. is African American, mm. and uh, African Americans have suffered through systemic racism decades, you know. and uh, opportunities being not provided uh, and uh, so what i did first thing i did when i became an mla or state representative in michigan was bring money home for education uh, you know i brought so much money more money than any previous state rep has brought in well, to for us it's hard to explain what does bring money home i uh, mean if you could just elaborate yeah. on that yeah so so uh, basically uh, the state government uh, has funds available okay. right and then uh, each of us represent a certain district you know 13th east, district is yours right 13, yeah third, in congress now in congress yeah but the third district in the state house state okay wow. so uh, you know i fought and i said that we need to have uh, you know uh, economic equity hmm. 
the schools in uh, low income neighborhoods in america are typically underfunded yeah so we got funding there so that these schools can hire good teachers so in this area which is depressed economically depressed african american uh, primarily you beat eight of african american candidates and you win the democratic uh, primary how did you manage to do that you don't look like yeah. everybody you don't speak like everybody you're an indian immigrant first time immigrant first generation how did you manage to convince these people that you could be their voice and that was not very easy mm. uh, because you know everybody wants their leader their representative to look like them yeah. be uh, with a similar background but you know what i did was i went and talked to people mm. uh not only i talked uh, to people in uh, uh, the more affluent areas but i made it a point to go visit Uh, the low income areas talk to people be accessible i would street stand at a street corner hmm. and talk to people you know people will roll down their windows and talk to me at uh, intersections and what really resonated was me dealing with mental illness in my family uh, me de- dealing with poverty me dealing with struggles and i'm still- guessing that these african americans in your district with the people you have voted they had gone through uh similar or somewhat similar experiences at least some of them some, some of, of the people yeah. yeah and so they understood my struggle or prejudice if nothing yes. else they I, i mean that. there is a lot of racism in america sure. still and uh, you know uh, there is a lot of discrimination uh, and uh, people uh, you know understood my story of struggle and never giving up and fighting for it and uh, and and i think that's where i won uh, hearts and Also but I you did, were already a millionaire several times over but they didn't hold that against you Some people did okay. but most people understood who I was when I told my story they understood who I am and uh, uh, you know that is uh, who supported me uh, you know uh, Congressman you know Indian Americans in politics now um it's not a new f- phenomenon if if you google there'll be about 150 but there are some names which stick out you know and uh, vice president kamala harris is one of them there is curiosity in india about her as to why she hasn't come and visited it's been 4 years now she hasn't been here uh, whereas when she was when she stood for election she talked about her indian parentage talked about that experience of her parents um but uh, of her mother uh, and she sp- spoke about party and she spoke about chitti and all those tamil words she used um, but she hasn't come and then there is vivek ramaswamy in the republican party uh, indians are curious to know about these two have you met them what do you have to say about that yeah i was uh, at uh, vice president kamala harris's home she had invited us uh, for dinner and uh, we had a really great conversation uh she is a great partner for president biden mm. president biden has trusted her and uh, assigned her so many difficult things uh, in terms of uh, immigration issues in terms of uh, uh, mental health issues so so she has been very very active she's one of the most active vice presidents uh, and uh, she uh, will be the vice president as uh president biden seeks another term in 2024 hmm. um in terms of uh, uh, the other indian american candidates of course vivek ramaswamy is a republican i'm a democrat so sure. we have policy differences on issues yeah. that we differ on yeah but the nice thing about america is its diversity hmm. you know our strength is in our diversity and uh, america uh, values that hmm. and that is really uh, something uh, interesting to see and admire another american politician who's very popular in india she's not an indian american uh, but because she's a hindu tulsi gabbard yes. there's a lot of curiosity about her too why did she leave your party what happened i don't know what happened uh, to mm-hmm. her but i think she is an uh, i see her uh, on television as a commentator sometime but mm-hmm. uh, uh you know people have different different views different uh, issues uh, uh but uh, the nice thing about america is is very inclusive you know mm. uh, people the freedom of speech is very very important so people can say what they have in our mind 
without fear of being persecuted yeah, without fear yeah, of being... your first amendment i mean this is what many indians find it so difficult to accept i guess that you know when uh, when khalistanis attack the indian uh, mission when they uh, threaten uh, indian diplomats it all comes under the freedom yes. bit Yeah. It, it's it's many Indians find that difficult to accept that freedom part. Yeah, well, on television you will see uh, politicians, uh, President Biden or President Trump when he was uh, president, he was ridiculed all the time. Yeah, uh, uh, Gerald Ford, you know, he would fall and they'll make fun of him. Mm. So, uh, so it's that's the culture. People uh, really feel free to say what's on their mind. and uh, that f- first right of amendment uh, first right of speech is protected that's uh, constitutionally protected and that's the beauty of america but this is a threat this is a full on threat that khalistanis make to yes. oh, so that diplomats. is different that is different yeah. so when that happened when they attacked the embassy uh, they tried to uh, burn the embassy and uh, so uh, look a uh, first amendment sp- freedom to speak your mind everybody understands but that doesn't mean that you have a right to do violence mm-hmm. that doesn't mean you're right to threaten people's lives or take people's lives that's never acceptable that's never tolerated mm-hmm. uh, so any peaceful protest uh, is fine and that should be encouraged and that should be accepted yeah. that's our fundamental human right but vandalism no vandalism no attacking uh, people's lives is no absolutely unacceptable right. we will not accept a domestic terrorism we will not accept international terrorism and we'll always uh, and so i asked uh, and we asked the biden administration to uh, protect uh, provide more protection uh, to uh, you know embassies and democratic institutions uh, similarly provide more protection uh, to temples and uh, places of worship because uh, people should have a freedom to worship uh, whatever god they want to worship or not worship anyone at all uh, similarly you know same way with uh, people's uh, choice to love who they want to love mm. so these are fundamental human rights and those need to be protected and uh, you know we fight for that see uh in your country there is nothing like uh, i guess uh, there is nothing like a flag code uh, burning a flag and all is not an offense stamping on a flag is not a, an offense uh, in india we have very strict uh, flag code so uh, something like that happens so it and more than anything else it it just uh, it upsets people it's mm-hmm. a sentiment yes. you know when you see uh, an indian flag being stamped upon uh, burnt uh, and defaced uh, in in america you just indians turn around and whether it's on social media or on the streets in this is a country which is supposed to be a friend of ours now it's a democracy believes in the same kind of world view that we do of course we differ on certain issues pakistan being mm-hmm. one but uh, why is it that uh, people who have such anti indian and anti democracy views why are they allowed to vandalize indian property it really it it is upsetting to indians yeah. i hope you realize that uh, absolutely absolutely yeah. so sometime you know uh, things may be uh, unpleasant mm. uh, you know we don't like uh, uh, american flag to be disrespected correct at the, yet at the same time uh, there is a, a price to pay for democracy yeah and sometime that means uh, you give the freedom a peaceful protesting freedom to people uh you may not agree with their views yet uh, it's important in a democratic uh, country uh, to have that and so that's what me- that's why american democracy is so robust mm. because uh, uh, people have that freedom we may not agree with them their views uh, we may not agree with their actions as long as they are peaceful as long as they are not uh, you know uh, taking lives or, or affecting uh, human beings uh, in in a in an adverse way uh freedom of expression is is fundamental to our democracy you know you went in the uh, towards the end of 70s uh it was a difficult uh, era uh in india um we just won a war but then we, it is a post emergency india uh, we've gone through emergency which was like very difficult period um and uh, you go to america how difficult was it for you to adjust to the american way of life to the freedoms 
of America was it liberating experience or was it frightening experience at that stage it was extremely liberating mm-hmm. you know back then you uh, you know you don't talk to girls you just focus on studies i you know uh, the arranged marriage and you know th- those that was the culture back then you were shy and i was shy and awkward. i was awkward you know i had never had a girlfriend or a, f- a woman friend and then i go there and uh, look at the american life and i was just mesmerized by that hmm. not only uh, the culture uh, the openness uh, the arts uh, you know uh, right before that i was i seen emergency and you know the the curtailing of freedom we had to do street theater or little ways to protest and uh, going to this country where there was so much freedom uh, not only freedom uh, to express yourself but a freedom uh, to uh, be with uh, you know a friend a woman uh, a girlfriend you know that was all very liberating mm. and for almost 5 years i became so part of the american culture uh, almost you know many of the other indian students what they would do is they'll make a little india for themselves they will still cook cook, cook chicken curry and uh, listen to gulam ali or whatever you know what were you doing i was uh, with my american friends uh, <laughs> okay. and you know i was a graduate student as in a phd program but the people that i found most interesting was the first and second year college students because they were living a really interesting life they were partying and they were you know uh, just socializing and i just became a part of that culture because i found that fascinating to the point that i and back then you know no phone calls you know there's no phone uh, there's no internet so there's no, no face time yeah, yeah. there's no whatsapping so uh, and i was fluent in marathi right marathi. Uh, going there but i had no marathi friends and i had i lost uh, um, an ability to speak marathi oh. and after 5 years i was finally able to come home and when i'm back fam- to belgao back to belgao and i came in with and they thought oh our son has gone to america he's become so successful i come in here with my t-shirt and torn jeans and they and i couldn't speak marathi uh, to my family it took me a while to catch up the language yeah uh, so i mean i was just to become be, be, had become so part of the american culture but then i started to realize uh, uh, the my or, roots and my origin and later on i became the head of the marathi organization of north america okay <laughs> i wrote a book in marathi okay. uh, he shri chi icha which became very popular shri icha he shri chi icha and that translates to uh, this is shri's uh, desire wish So the whole thing is she about She is your uh, first my name. Okay. So the whole idea there was um, you know my I spell my name as Shri is S H R I so uh, which is a little confusing here mm. in in India. But uh, I wrote my story very honestly. Mm. You know a lot of times you know the wife suicide uh, normally people would not talk about it yeah. or hide it or say something else. Yeah. And I just wrote it the way it it, it happened. Mm. I wrote about my struggles in America. Uh, i wrote a, it very transparently and people really like that and i got i would get letters even now i get letters from people who say that there was a tragedy in their life whether mental illness or they had a divorce or a, a death or whatever and they said that your book gave me strength one of the person wrote that he had bought 50 books of mine he had given it to relatives and friends who are depressed and who have you know psychologically they so many people said uh, you know i had given up on my life you know i got divorced i felt so ashamed uh, or you know whatever my son committed suicide or somebody said he got paralyzed and then he had ambition and he said after reading your book i've decided to go and do what i really wanted to do okay so i get these letters uh, hundreds mm. hundreds and thousands of letters uh, and uh, you know that that my my story impacted uh, people you know you were talking about how uh, you you made a lot of money you were successful your children have stabilized you have a new wife you're happily married now and at some point of time you say no i want to give back to society now i want to come, i don't know whether you've seen this movie called swades of yes. uh, sharukh khan yeah yeah, yeah? great so movie yeah great movie that immigrant experience did you had any point of time have that tug of heart and say that I want to go back 
home to Belgaum and I want to do something back home there. Because, you know, I've met so many Indians in America and in fact in UK and uh, abroad who have that, that thing that, okay, I've made it. Now I want to give back to society. Do I give back to society here, which has already got a lot? Or do I go back to India, to my village from where I came and do something out there? Where does that, did that ever happen to you? No, because, you know, look, when I went to America, I had nothing. Mm. And America gave me so much. Look, I feel that India is fine. India has this tremendous uh, young people, uh, strength uh, in there. So they don't need me. Hmm. Uh, but I saw in America, uh, there are people that are struggling, hmm. people that don't have access to the American dream. I saw people that are facing with, uh, uh, you know, uh, racial discrimination. Uh, and I felt that this new country that I have adopted as my home uh, and my home country, I want to work and give back, you know, because America has given me so much. I, I want to give back. India is fine. India can, there's lots of good people that are, working and India is rising and doing fine. I need to be, uh, give back to my, uh, the society that accepted me, adopted me, even though I was different, even though, you know, I looked differently, I uh, spoke differently and yet they accepted me. They gave me opportunities uh, and I want to give back to this society, yeah. help my community. And that's what I'm doing. I'm, uh, you know, helping uh, entrepreneurship, uh, s small business ownership, opportunities uh, to uh, marginalized communities, underserved communities. You know, so we were talking about Vivek Ramaswamy earlier. I saw this one interaction he had. It was a kind of a town hall uh, in which uh, he got asked about, uh, are you a Hindu? And is that going to be a problem? Because we have Christian values out here. Uh, you don't worship Christ. So what's, what's that going to be? And then he explained about universal values of all religions. Uh, and then he explained in great detail what Hinduism had and the similarity in the Christian faith uh, and in Buddhism. He talked about all that and he said, I'm, I want to run for the president. I don't want to run for a pastor's job. So, um, of course, there were then, uh, there was laugh uh, going around all over and things like that. So, did that come up uh, when you were standing for politics? You're born into a Hindu family. Absolutely, so. yes. So, so, I think what American people want is authenticity. Mm. You know, because a lot of politicians want to pr uh, portray an image of something that they may not be. Mm. So, I think uh, America's realizing is that an American voters, uh, what they want is somebody that is authentic and genuine and honest and transparent. And that's what, what I have done. I have been gone there, said who I am, what my story is, uh, not uh, trying to modify it, not trying to change it. And then I, I go make it a point to go listen to people. Did you play down uh, the fact that you are a Hindu? No, absolutely not. You didn't. So I, uh, you know, so the, the, and again, my religion did not figure into because, you know, America is uh, a melting pot. America has, uh, you know, different religions and religious freedom is a uh, constitutionally guaranteed right. Uh, so, absolutely. But it did, right? I mean, it does figure. We know what happened with President Obama. The number of times that it was written in, I mean, Donald Trump said it, that he's a Muslim and it kept on and on and on. So, religion does matter in the US. It, it does because, you know, those things that are uh, extreme uh, conversation like that gets, media picks it that up and there's a lot more uh, talked about His it. His birth certificate kept coming <laughs> up. Kept, I know. Right? I know. I mean, but look, that didn't stop people. We from read about it, it in India. So. I know, but that didn't stop people from no, electing a person Correct. that is that looked different. You know, there has never been a African American chosen as a president of America, yeah. and despite all that criticism, because he brought hope. Hmm. What Obama brought was hope, hmm. and he communicated and articulated his vision so well, uh, and people elected him. Look, uh, there is only about fourteen percent of uh, Americans are African Americans, and yet uh, he uh, he got elected and he got re-elected. He served. Uh, America as its president for eight years. Mm -hmm. So so that is the greatness of America. Right. Yeah. That It's also something that Indians like about America. And uh, I mean, Indians want to go to America. They When they go on holidays, uh, when they visit relatives, uh, when they go to study uh, in the U.S., uh, that, that acceptance for of contrarian views. Exactly. It, that is something that 
India finds, uh, you know, that we are akin to them, like, you know, on that. But on a on the international sphere, tell me, is the uh, does the administration also accept that India can have contrarian views, like on Russia, like mm -hmm. on China, like on Pakistan? Is there a maturity now that, hey, India will do what it wants to do, will be our ally, will be our friend, will be uh, a partner, maybe not an ally, a partner, but a partner who might have different views? Absolutely. So it's about friendship. It's mm. about uh, trusting each other. Mm. And uh, it's not colonization. You know, uh, India is too big, too powerful. Mm. Uh, and India needs to do what it needs to do and stand on its own. And America needs to realize that uh, America, India needs to be respected. You know, India needs to be treated uh, on an equal basis. And that's what the basis has to be for a really strong relationship. But yet, India and America need to be strong friends because uh, the alternative isn't acceptable. You know, China and Russia are colluding and uh, we cannot let uh, these dictatorial uh, regi regimes uh, to control the economy, control the science. We are talking about uh, artificial intelligence uh, that could be a very, very beneficial to our society or it could create a lot of harm. Mm. And someone like China, someone uh, places that are dictatorial, uh, how would they use this technology? Uh, it, it can create, destabilize the world. It can destabilize and create, uh, uh, you know, uh, harm the peace uh, in the world. And uh, uh, democ democracies like India and United States need to work together. Uh, you know, uh, we have no alternative but to work together. Uh, and we need to have a res mutually respectable relationship. Well, most Indians get that. Mm -hmm. But... I come back to what we started with, in which I said that there's, there was a mutual suspicion. That suspicion, I think, is gone down, uh, especially, uh, uh, you know, in the bureaucracy, uh, which in both countries, nobody trusted each other. That seems to have gone down a bit. More interaction, people-to-people -people contact, uh, Indian bureaucrats, their children studying. That makes a lot of difference. Yes. Um, Indian businessmen, uh, people of Indian origin who are you know, in influential positions in the U.S., um, all those things matter. And uh, and yet, we live in this region. We have China in our backyard, uh, an aggressive, antagonistic China, and we have a friend in Russia. So we live in this neighborhood. Uh, the America, uh, the American interest in in this region. Uh, has been served by Pakistan, neither by uh, China nor by Russia. It's been served by Pakistan, who's been our enemy number one. And now, shifting of gears, which is happening. So it's hard for this chess game, you know, for everything to fall into place. Uh, uh, what is your view on this? Well, we, we need new alignments. Right. The old alignments have changed. Uh, you know, China's aggression. At the same time, China's huge economic power. Uh, that is, uh, you know, uh, we we really cannot predict what the dictators uh, will do, how they will, what their policies are going to be, mm -hmm. and so we democracies need to stick together. Whether it is India, whether it is uh, United States, uh, I just was spent a, t a week in Israel, mm -hmm. and Israel has uh, a strong democracy. So these in in a very unstable world. Uh, so we need to really be protecting these democracies. We need to stick together. Uh, yes, we there are we are not going to be perfect. You know, not everything that India does is something that United States will will want. But at the same time, there needs to be a mutual respect uh, and a very strong trusting relationship. We need to stick together. Otherwise, uh, China and Russia and the dictatorial um, and uh, dictators will, you know, we, we really can't sure. let them win. You know, on uh, the, the media in America and the social media in India are completely distrustful of each other. Uh, the traditional media or the old media in the U.S., uh, feels that there's a right-wing government in India uh, and it's curbing democracy. The social media in India feels that America only looks at its own interests. These are the two factors which are pulling apart the relationship to a large extent. Um, justifiable or not justifiable, that time will tell. But these are two things where there is a great deal of suspicion 
uh, with regard to each other do you agree yeah absolutely so the media uh, doesn't always portray uh, it rightly you know media always portrays america being rich and uh, you know uh, not all america is is uh, hollywood hmm. you know there are people that live in under poverty there are people who are not able to afford a water bill or mm. people that are can uh, pay their mortgage uh, there are issues um, where is lack of education healthcare is a big issue mental illness is is a huge issue the opioid crisis opioid is opioid crisis big is, big is a big issue so we, uh, each country has its own issues on sure. uh, yeah and sometimes uh, the media only looks at the extreme and so what social media projects or what uh, the general media projects is more of the extreme of each of the countries mm. but uh, the main uh, so the, that's why this delegation i you know brought in modi ji when i he and i sp- spent a, a good uh, 30 40 minutes together modi ji said to me that uh, uh, shri bring uh, american congress members to india and she, he said don't just take them to taj mahal and take a picture show them how india is how in in harmony india lives uh, and different people different backgrounds live together uh, show the the young people and how motivated they are uh, and their their goals and their dreams so uh, i think more we interact with each other and not just rely on social media not just rely on print media uh, the better it would be so are you going to be briefing your colleagues in your political party absolutely after modi ji's speech uh, many uh, americans uh, members of congress uh, uh, republican members democrat they came to me and they were very impressed with his vision and what he spoke mm. and uh, you know there is a bipartisan support for india and for the and finally uh, you know uh, america is recognizing the importance of india in the world peace you know this uh, the indian american associations in in the us uh they play a major role in improving or uh destabilizing relations between two countries uh they've always played a very major role whether it is a visit of an indian prime minister or uh, or, or an american president uh they also are contributors uh to uh, you know the caucuses which are there um what is the view and now it seems to be divided there are some associations which are you know very very vitriolic in their criticism uh, of what's happening in india and they feel that uh, a hindu uh, a party is in power in india and that is detrimental uh, to the to to india's progress um do you in any manner or does your uh, party in any manner after your delegation level visit will they talk to those associations and tell them about democracy in india uh, not necessarily you can have your political views of course about the bjp or the rss or or the the muslim parties in india or the congress party in india you could have your political views but essential democracy in india the essential systems in place in india do you feel that you could be able to you could change their views in any manner absolutely and the more we interact more we travel uh, see things with your own eyes and that's what i tell my um, other members of congress who are critical of india that come see it with your own eyes feel it you know see the democracy see the freedom see the democracy see the you know uh, how uh, people live Uh, and you will change your mind mm-hmm. you know and that's what I, i i don't didn't had to really because i lived here i know i lived for 24 years so i know what india is like and uh, you speak marathi i speak marathi fluently yeah, like, i speak hindi i speak I understand gujarati and a little bit of kannada and right? a little bit of kannada yes yes i'm so proud so no uh, in conclusion i have to say this though you haven't eaten any of the food which has been i got the pedas because i knew you speak marathi yes but i got that but you haven't eaten it but you know what congressman i want you to have a little bit of the mysore pak because solpa solpa how do right How solpa do. yeah yeah and well you know mysore pak i grew up eating mysore pak mysore and kunda pa. and you know peda darwari peda darwari peda yeah this is amazing right. amazing so, right yeah. i so, should have had darwar peda so now there's a huge dispute which is going on not about belgaum though you probably remember the period when belgaum was in dispute right belgaum yeah. so the dispute is whether uh, uh, mysore pak is kannadiga 
is it from Karnataka or not? <laughs> and as a congressman, what is your view? Well, Mysore Park is Mysore Park. It's Mysore. It's Karnataka. You know, but I can test the ghee and the <laughs> basin. Basin is really very nicely done. So there we have. So we have a U.S. congressman who's also said that Mysore Park is from Karnataka. So there you are. <laughs> are you taking back any mithai? Yes, I will. You will. I always okay. do. I always do. I love sweets. Okay. Even do you though have I'm good a di diabetic. I, I started learning and liking sweets more after I was diagnosed with diabetes. <laughs> <laughs> I like most Indians, I think, who uh, who are diabetic but cannot leave that mithai part, yeah, right? I know. There's something to it. Uh, and especially Indian restaurants, I think, in America, the mithai is just not right. Not right. The dal would be good. The curries are fine. The roti chapati is okay. But the mithai, yeah. I think that you get in yeah, India. Yeah. You don't get that. And, and a meal is not a meal until you eat that gulab jamun or the burfi or the peda or whatever that is. You right. Know? Congressman, I want, I've want. i heard that you sing and you sing well. So, you know, um, I want you to sing a song which meant a lot to you uh, when you were a student or later, something that is special to you. So, uh, I told you about uh, my wife, Shashi. Right. And what a difference she made as she came into our broken... Uh, uh, house and she made it a uh, home again so um you know m one of my favorite um movies is kavi kavi i i must have seen that movie 10 times amitabh bachchan amitabh bachchan right and uh, so i'm going to sing this song for oh. i mean i'm not a singer so no, that's pardon funny. me you know i'm i'm um, perhaps uh, your viewers uh, would tell me that stick with my day job and uh, <laughs> <laughs> don't ever sing but I am uh, just because you asked me just yes, to respect you do. I'm going to say uh, so here's for, for my wife Kabhi kabhi mere dil mein khayal aata hai ke jaise tujko banaya gaya hai मेरे लिए तू अब से पहले सितारों में बस रही थी कहीं तुझे जमी पे बुलाया गया है मेरे लिए हिंदी सॉन्ग from the only United States congressman who speaks Hindi oh. and speaks Marathi. Speaks Marathi. <laughs> yeah, this this film, this song was picturized on uh, Amitabh Bachchan and Rakhi. Yes. It was, it was it, I think everybody who saw that film was touched at that point of time, right? It, yes, absolutely. It kind of, uh, I mean, for all of us, it was the yardstick of what romance should be. <laughs> it should be. Right? And you know, in my family, the way they raised, my, my parents raised me as, don't uh, see Hindi movies <laughs> and don't eat meat. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the rebellious things I used to do when I was young was to go out and watch Hindi movies. I love Hindi movies. There was and this times is a lovely... You sang so beautifully. Oh. <laughs> okay, so, so you, you watched movies then. I used to watch Hindi movies. There was a year I counted how many movies I watched. I've watched 70 Hindi movies. Go to the theater and watch these movies. It was also the link for most expats in those days, right? Yeah, yeah. When you didn't have OTT platforms, you didn't have yeah. online, uh, you couldn't speak to your family. This was one way to connect one to way. India. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, no, this was when I was living in India. I oh, it was to, in I, India. Yeah, okay. I used to watch Hindi movies and I used to love, I love Hindi movies. And when you went to the US, then what was your connection then? Well, like I told you, first, I, I was so immersed in American life. But they later on, okay. later on, I did come back to my roots and became very involved in the Marathi. And then I hosted Marathi events at my home. Marathi, I brought over Marathi artists and Hindi artists. So, uh, so it changed. Okay. Uh, but uh, and I kind of got in back in touch with the roots, of my roots. So thank you so much for being part of this podcast, Congressman, and hope you come back uh, to India with your family, with your sons, with your wife, and uh, you take back happy memories from India. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you viewers for watching or listening to this episode. Do like or subscribe on whichever channel you have seen this or heard this. Namaste. Jai Hind. Click here to watch the previous episodes.